It's a delight uh, to share with you in this event um, on something that is so close to my heart. And uh, so I welcome you on behalf of, of uh, the congregation um, that I have been privileged to serve here these last 29 years and to share with you the most critical information you need to know. And that is that the bathrooms are outside this door out here. And uh, uh, if people go and try to find them uh, by going downstairs, uh, uh, we may not find you again for days or weeks. So, uh, so please do go that direction by the bathrooms. We are pleased to have uh, folks here from Solidary Tea who have been sharing with us, and you are welcome. Hey, hey. You are welcome to share, uh, uh, to partake uh, throughout the event this afternoon and bring it into this space. Just be mindful and careful with your cups if you do that. Um, this event is being sponsored uh, by a number of organizations, the Community Alliance of Lane County, uh, Code Pink, that has a display back there, uh, WAND, uh, 350 Eugene, uh, Existence uh, Rebellion, did I get that right? Extinction. Extinction Rebellion, I abbreviated it. I knew I didn't abbreviate it right. Extinction Rebellion, thank you. Um, Taxes for Peace, Not War, and a brand new organization you're gonna hear more about a little bit later, uh, The Planet versus the Pentagon. And you can imagine where that's going already, right? Um, so, I was on my way home from visiting my daughter in Southern California over the holidays when I received a text from her that kind of emphasizes the importance of this event. She wanted me to know that in case we had not gotten the word, having been out of cell service, that she said, quote, it's possible Trump started World War III. And you of course know that I'm referring to the assassination of Soleimani. Now fortunately that did not happen, at least not yet. Um, but it made me very aware that we need to do something to speak up and to make our voices heard. No war on Iran. So the first thing I did wanting to do my part was I called Michael Kerrigan. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you, Michael. Uh, fortunately, he, even though he's retired, he's still doing great things like this. But as uh, Soleimani's assassination made so clear, stumbling into a broader war in the Middle East is not only possible. With the mindset of our current administration, it is even probable. Unless we, the people of this country, make clear that going to war over Iran, and let's be clear, that's precisely what this is about, uh, going to war over oil in Iran, uh, is not an option. So today we want to make that connection between war and climate change, right? And particularly our use of fossil fuels because the two are so closely related. How we treat each other and how we treat the earth are really two sides of the same coin. For if we are to survive and thrive as a human society, we must learn how to walk more gently on this earth in solidarity with one another. And that means with all peoples of the earth, not just certain folks that look like us or happen to have the privilege of being citizens of our country or other privileges that many of us share. And so we want to begin today with the acknowledgement of the indigenous people who preceded us in this place and from whom we still have much to learn about the sacredness of the earth. And so Patty Hine and Deb McGee, uh, progressive leaders in our community, known well, I think, to many of you, um, and the co-directors and founders of 350, Eugene, will lead us in a reflection on the ancestral roots of this place, as well as, I think, a song. Thank you very much, Dan. It's always a pleasure to be over here with the disciples, where I started. It's a privilege to be part of the anti-war movement. I'm a retired Navy officer, for some of you who don't know, and it always pains me to see what insanity our foreign policy has turned into. Not that it hasn't always been. I'm privileged to give the land acknowledgement. This beautiful land where we are gathering, which was unjustly stolen by European settlers, 
belongs to the Kalapuya people. Okay, thank you. Between the, la the late 18th century and early 19th centuries, settlers murdered, sickened, and forcibly relocated thousands of Kalapuyans, comprising the Tualatin Yamhill Kalapuyans in the north and the Santa Mackenzie in the central and south, and in Yonkala to the south. In the Umpqua Valley and beyond, their number was 13,500 at their height and 300 in 1844. Settlers set up boarding schools like Chemawa in Salem to instruct native children to give up their culture and removed federal recognition of the Kalapuyas tribe's existence. Today, the Willamette Valley remains occupied by non-natives. The timber industry, mineral and energy extraction projects, and fossil fuel profiteers continue to exploit the land without regard for the wishes of the well-being of the native folks who have always lived here. The impact of wars and climate crisis and extreme energy disproportionately impact indigenous peoples, communities of color, and low-income communities those least responsible for causing the problem and the first to be hit by their impacts. Whether from droughts that threaten traditional foods, wildfire smoke that hospitalizes people, or heat waves that literally kill people, frontline communities are already feeling the impacts of climate change and face serious and disproportionate threats to cultural sites and lands, traditional foods, water rights, and more. From the climate crisis to endless wars and export projects, it is in the spirit of solidarity that we recognize and support and join with Native leadership in this collective struggle for peace and justice. So to set the tone for our gathering today, I think we all feel a deep sense of, we're a little scared, I think, right? So let us center ourselves in what we know really unites us, the spirit. So I'm going to sing the song with Debbie and we're gonna teach it to you. And then we hope that you'll join in when you feel comfortable. It goes like this. Spirit, fall on us like the rain. Spirit, blow on us like the wind. Spirit, shine on us like the sun, like the sun. Sanctify and heal us, make us one. Spirit, fall on us like the rain. Spirit, blow on us like the wind. Spirit, shine on us like the sun, like the sun. Sanctify and heal us, make us one. Thank you, Patty and Deb. Let me take a moment just to uh, recognize and honor our veterans present. If you're a veteran, just raise your hand. We want to uh, thank and honor the veterans here. And uh, we're particularly uh, pleased that uh, Mike Peterson, um, a Vietnam War veteran, is here with us. Um, and he is active in the local Veterans for Peace chapter. Mike? Thank you, Dan. Um, and Deb and Patty, you uh, centered us. Hi, my name is Mike Peterson, and I am a Marine Combat Veteran of the Vietnam War and member of Veterans for Peace Chapter 159, Eugene, Oregon. Haven't we learned our lesson? First it was Vietnam, then it was Afghanistan, then it was Iraq. Now looms an impending war with Iran. War with Iran is a very real disaster with a potentially high cost in American and Iranian lives, with repercussions that will resonate throughout all the Middle East. But getting back to myself and my experiences as they pertain to our reason for this get-together. 
I enlisted in 1967 and went to Vietnam in January of 68 and served a 13-month tour and two six-month extensions. I hated Vietnam less than Marine Crotch or Corps. My two extensions were for duty with the Combined Action Program, the Marines' answer to the other war in Vietnam, the winning over of the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people. A cat platoon consisted of a squad of Marines teamed with a platoon of popular forces, the lowest of the low in the Army of the Republic of Vietnam's hierarchy. We patrolled a given hamlet 24-7, we virtually lived in that hamlet. I like to think we saved our hamlets from the Marine and Army Grunt Battalion's massive destructions of those hamlets they had occupied. Eventually, I came to love the Vietnamese people and their country. I was a member of Team 1 of the Veterans of Vietnam Restoration Project uh, for two months in 1989, and again in 2014, I went back for a two weeks visit with my wife, Janet. Anyway, I was approaching the end of my second extension and returned to civilian life and had to train my replacement as CAP Commander, one Thomas Williams. In short, and to be as charitable as possible, I should never have been allowed to command a CAP platoon in the first place. I was 20 at the time and immature and inattentive. I believed for the longest time that I had walked into an Arvin ambush, resulting in the death of that Marine, Tom Williams, and the wounding of another. The death of Tom changed my gung-ho desire for war and all its horrid permutations. God had made me largely a pacifist. There was, for me, a near suicide with the fall of the South in 1975. I knew at that time that I could do it, and then would do it. The thought of that eventuality scared the shit out of me, and I never again considered suicide. And thank God that I never did, because around the year 2000, when Doug Remion was assigned to our cap around the time of Tom's death, Doug uh, reminded me, and I needed the reminding, that the Arvin unit that we had bumped into that night was not supposed to be there. They were meant to be somewhere else, out of range, of our proposed ambush. Can you imagine the relief I felt that it was not my fault that Tom Williams died? Had I committed suicide in the mid-1970s, I would never have known that fact. It was like a 30-year sentence for me. I hated war only because I prayed I would not be responsible for the death of another Marine. Uh, and when, in fact, that indeed happened, only then was my revulsion for war complete. I needed the shit kicked out of me to do my sentence, then was ultimately relieved that it was not my fault in the first place, but only after I first learned to hate war. I will conclude my remarks by reading a ballad or poem by Trinh Cong Son, who was South Vietnam's song songwriter then, and was roundly despised by both the southern and northern governments at the time, and is known as the Vietnam's answer, Vietnam's answer to Bob Dylan. Trinh Cong Song was a native of Hue City, the old imperial capital, during the Mandarin times. 21 months after the ordeal of Hue, Song wrote for a visitor a ballad in March of 1969 to express his feelings. Uh, the poem ballad was written by a Vietnamese for Vietnamese. Hue was the site of the ma massacre of some 5,800 people by communist forces. That's a fact. But I think that Son's message resonates to all people everywhere. Translated into English, it reads, When I went up a high hill of an afternoon, I sang on top of corpses. I saw, I saw, I saw, beside a garden hedge, a mother hugging her child's corpse. Mothers clap for joy over your children's corpses. Mothers clap and cheer for peace. 
Everyone clapped to add another beat. Everyone clapped to welcome hardship. When I went to the strawberry patch, I sang on top of corpses. I saw, I saw, I saw on the road an old father hugging the corpse of his frost-cold child. When I went to the strawberry patch of an afternoon, I saw, I saw, I saw holes and trenches full of corpses of my brothers and sisters. Mothers clap for joy over war. Sisters clap and cheer for peace. Everyone clap for more vengeance. Everyone clap instead of repenting. Thank you, Mike. We are uh, pleased to have with us today uh, both candidates for the Democratic primary for our congressional district. And uh, I had a, intended a rather lighthearted introduction of the incumbent, but I'm going to pass on that, uh, given Mike's uh, uh, sharing with us. Um, just suffice it to say that uh, Congressman DeFazio has been in this seat for a long time. Um, almost as long as this building has been here, but not quite, right? And uh, we are very thrilled to have him with us today to share with us his thoughts on how we got to this place where we are. Congressman DeFazio. On January 3rd, uh, with one impulsive, reckless, selfish, unlawful act, Trump brought the United States to the brink of a war with Iran. He assassinated Soleimani and nine others with a drone strike. A plane full of civilians died because of the tension he created in the region. And 34 American troops were bombarded, get what Trump said were headaches. Actually, traumatic brain injury, a little bit worse than a headache. But the president wouldn't know of that. Now, George Bush's invasion of Iraq was based on intelligence falsified by uh, Vice President Cheney, Scooter Libby, in regard to weapons of mass destruction. It stands still today as the worst foreign policy mistake in the history of the United States of America. <laughs> War with Iran would be even worse. But Donald Trump is not the first corrupt, unstable, law-breaking president to abuse his office in violation of the Constitution and unlawfully engage our military in hostilities. Richard M. Nixon was elected, I remember very well as a young man of draft age, with a secret plan to end the war. Uh, I didn't vote for him. But um, four years later, he engaged in an incredible expansion and escalation of the war in Vietnam by secretly carpet bombing Cambodia, a neutral nation in the region. The Vietnam War itself was launched under false pretenses, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Only two dissenting votes in the United States House and the United States Senate of all those members of Congress, only two, Ernest Gruning from Alaska and Wayne Morse from Oregon. <laughs> Senator Morse, who I met, uh, admired. Uh, I have this picture hanging in the very small hero's corner in my Washington, D.C. office. And when we're voting late, we sometimes have a chat while I'm drinking a beer. And he uh, would be totally, totally disgusted by what the Senate has become under Mitch McConnell's leadership. Yeah. In 1973, Congress finally had enough after the secret bombing, and they passed the War Powers Act, ultimately passed over President Nixon's veto. But there were two versions. There was a strong version which fully reflected the constitutional war-making authority of Congress. There was a second version not so much. 
Unfortunately, in conference, the second version prevailed, and we've been stuck with it ever since. That one allows the president to engage in hostilities outside his constitutional authority, but then report to Congress. In this case, Trump tweeted within 48 hours and said, Congress is hereby notified. Uh, and I, absolutely outrageous. And then Congress has 60 days to approve or the troops have to be withdrawn. It just never works that way. Once the hostilities start, the blood starts running, we have casualties, it won't stop. So I've been working for years. Years ago, I went to Larry Tribe, constitutional scholar at Harvard, and I say, how can I fix this? And he helped me rewrite the War Powers Act in a way uh, that truly reflects the division of powers between the President and the Congress and reserves for Congress the right to engage in hostilities that aren't in defense of the nation, our troops, or our citizens. So that's first, prior requires prior authorization. Second, and this is really critical, I'll get to this in a second, it will have a sunset clause. And the third is, even if those two things don't work, it would give Congress standing in court because we have gone to court over illegal actions of presidents of both parties uh, since I've been in Congress uh, using military power, and the courts say you don't have standing as the United States Congress. So I would give Congress standing. I'm hopeful that that legislation will soon be taken up uh, in the House, but we are going to take up some legislation next week. Uh, this summer, I voted for the National Defense Authorization, something I <laughs> don't normally do uh, because they've seen amount of money and waste at the Pentagon. But I did it because it was written by the Democrats and it incorporated seven critical Democratic priorities. Number one, it stated unequivocally the President did not have the authority to attack Iran and must come to Congress first and get authorization before he could attack Iran. Number two, it removed support for the Saudi slaughter of the people in Yemen. Num and this is the critical one, and we're going to vote on this next week. Number three, it repealed the authorization of use for military force to invade Iraq, George Bush's war in Iraq. When we went to the, we the so-called classified briefing where they were going to give us what they called exquisite intelligence about the imminent threats, uh, and why they had to do this in a sovereign nation, by the way. In, in, you know, uh, Iraq's supposed to be our ally now, and we did this on their territory. Uh, they said, uh, we got no intelligence about imminent attacks, but even worse, when finally someone raised their hand and said, well, what was your legal authority? They said, oh, the 2002 authorization of force to invade Iraq. And we're like, well, wait a minute, we invaded Iraq, took out a saying, we left, and then we only came back with the rise of ISIS. How could that be so? But they, nevertheless, his lawyers, oh, that's why we're doing it. So next week in the House, we will vote to repeal that authorization. Now, the bill also prohibited, and most model people don't know about this, but this is incredibly dangerous. It prohibited the development, deployment of low-yield nuclear weapons. And it stopped construction of the border wall, Trump's wall. It closed Guantanamo Bay, finally the prison camp that has given America a huge black eye around the world with the abuses that have gone there. And it nullified the transgender ban on our troops serving our country bravely. All those things were in the House bill. Unfortunately, uh, they ran into the rock of the Senate, and we lost on all those issues. They gave in, so I voted against the bill in the end. But now next week, we're going to vote separately on the repeal of the use of uh, 2002 use authorization of military force. That will pass the House, hopefully with some Republicans. There are 24 Republicans who voted with us last summer. Let's see what they do now in this atmosphere. Do they still have the courage of their convictions, or will they just be like the Senate? and do whatever it is Trump wants. We're also going to pass again the Kana, Ro Khanna's amendment, which says you cannot, you do not have the authority to attack Iran without specific authority from the United States Congress.
you know, uh, we've got to do more to rein in this ignorant, swaggering, wannabe tough guy who has dictator envy. You know, he dodged the Vietnam War because of fake bone spurs, but now he's a tough guy who'll send our young men and women into harm's way at a whim. Uh, so we have to move on and pass my legislation that will fix and clearly enunciate the war powers making authority between Congress and the President. You know, this was Martin Luther King week, so I think a good number of you there, we had a great turnout. Uh, so I thought it'd be fitting to close with a quote uh, from Martin Luther King. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. Let us not be that nation. We are collectively much, much better than that. Thank you very much. Let me just do one more thing. Go ahead. Just because I've got to say, between his speech and mine, it's like a little down. Let's just try something here, and this is real simple, simpler than the spiritual song. Uh, and it goes like this, no more bombs, no more war, how does the homeless feed the poor? Ready? All right. No more bombs, no, no more, more war, war. how does the homeless feed, feed the, the poor? poor? Louder. No, no more bombs, no, no more war, war. how does the homeless feed the poor? One more time. No more bombs, no more war, how does the homeless feed the poor? Thank you very much. Thank All you. Right. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Congressman. All right, so now I can't resist. Um, since uh, I've had the privilege, I want to thank the Congressman sincerely. I've had the privilege of working with him many times. And uh, 2009, religious leaders uh, gathered together to work on economic justice issues. And uh, then in 2002, 2006, the Save the Defer campaign. Anyone remember that? My picture's a little fuzzy because you know digital cameras had just been uh, invented. Uh, but Saved Our Fur was funded by the American Jewish Committee. And uh, then with our mothers uh, working to bring about women's suffrage. Um, <laughs> like I say, he's been with us for a long time, and we, we, we appreciate that very much. So um, continuing then, we invited uh, our senators to uh, share with us. And uh, they were not able to be here, but they did send us uh, statements uh, uh, first uh, coming uh, from uh, Senator Wayne uh, Chada, who's uh, been on his staff since 2000, where are you? A good many years, but, uh, and a great member of this community. We're delightful that she could be with us. And then after her, then uh, Michael Kerrigan will share uh, Senator Merkley's statement. So, Jim. Thank you, Dan, and um, thank you, everyone, for um, including me in today's program. Um, I'd like to uh, just give a really big shout out and thanks to Congressman DeFazio and his continued um, representation and leadership um, back in D.C. on our behalf. So I guess he had to take off early for another event, but thank you, Congressman. Um, currently, Senator Wyden is back in Washington, D.C. himself, and I think we all know why that is um, where he's at, um, but he wanted me to share um, his thoughts with you today. Friends, although I can't be with you today, I know as a former Eugene resident that Eugene will make sure its voices are heard loud and clear back at the White House. At my 10 town halls so far across our state this year, I have heard from Oregonians concerned about Donald Trump's cavalier use of force in the Middle East and lack of adequate planning in that region. Those Trump actions add up to a combustible combination that's made the Middle East a more dangerous place than it already was just a few weeks ago. The time is now for Congress to ensure this president does not unilaterally plunge our country into war. That's why I've supported 
a War Powers Resolution to force a debate and vote in Congress to prevent further escalation of hostilities with Iran. That's why I've introduced a resolution condemning Trump's threats to attack cultural sites in Iran and demanding he refrain from violating the laws of armed conflict. And that's why I've worked with colleagues on a bipartisan resolution making clear to Trump there's no congressional authorization for use of military force against Iran. I opposed a disastrous war in the Middle East in 2003, and I sure won't attempt, stand by while Trump drags us into another war that weakens our country. Sincerely, Ron Wyden, United States Senator. So uh, I'm uh, Michael Kerrigan. It's an honor to be here here today. Um, there are many peace, event, peace and justice events here, environmental events over the years. We are blessed to be in this wonderful place. So I've, I'll be reading the statement from Senator Merkley, Courtney Flathers, a staff person who was not able to make it today. President Trump and Secretary Pompeo are either dangerously inept or colossally ignorant and have done enormous damage to U.S. security. In short order, they have turned massive demonstrations in Iran against the Iran government into massive demonstrations against the U.S., turned demonstrations in Iraq against Iranian influence into demonstrations against U.S. influence, mobilized the Iraq parliament to vote to expel the United States forces from Iraq, given Iran an excuse to cancel the restraints on their nuclear program, that Iran had agreed to and followed for years before the Trump administration broke the agreement. Strengthened the role of Iranian militias in Iraq, expanding Iranian influence, the exact opposite of our goal of reducing Iran's influence in Iraq. Caused U.S. forces to set aside their operations against ISIS in order to prepare to defend themselves against attacks by Iran. Placed U.S. forces and assets in the region at greater risk of attack and most dangerously set in motion an escalation of attacks that could generate a war between the U.S. and Iran. Now all sane Americans must strive to stop this escalation into war. We must insist on following our U.S. Constitution, which gives Congress, not the President, the power to decide to go to war. Our founders argued that the cost of war and blood and treasure is far too great to be decided by one person. They were right the words for, from Senator Jeff Merkley. Thank you. So we turn from, um, federal, from the federal level to the local level, because all politics is local, right? And uh, Greg Evans, uh, Associate Vice President for Access, Equity, and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer at Lane Community College, has represented Ward 6 on the Eugene City Council since 2013. He's the first person of color to serve as the president of the League of Oregon Cities. Greg's career as an educator includes 23 years as a uh, classroom instructor, lecturer, workshop, workshop facilitator, and consultant. He's been an active leader, as I think most of you know, in our community on civil and human rights and transportation policy. He's the proud father of five children, and I just learned this interesting fact. His son, Malachi, is serving our country as an Air Force Staff Sergeant and Helicopter Crew Chief in South Korea. So Greg, thank you very much for coming to share with us. Let me make the adjustment for my height issue. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this guy right here. That's my son Malachi. And we are a military family. My father served in World War II. My uncle served in Korea and Vietnam. My cousins served in Vietnam. And they didn't all come back in one piece. I had a cousin who suffered from severe PTSD. We didn't know what that was at the time, but that's what he suffered from. And he ended up 
ending his life as an alcoholic because he drank himself to death after seeing what he saw in Vietnam. My son, when he came to us and said that he wanted to join the Air Force, he wanted to see the world, and he wanted to learn a trade. And he's done that. My son currently, is, his base station assignment is in Okinawa. And he has had a six month deployment to Kandahar in Afghanistan. Our family prayed hard that nothing would happen to him in Afghanistan. Then after he was there, he told me a little something that really scared me. He said, Dad, uh, I got to tell you, I went out with special forces and flew some missions in the desert. And I was like, he was like, and don't tell mom. <laughs> I said, well, I'm glad you're sharing this information with me. The door is always open, as you know to share that information. And I pray for you every single day. My son right now is on a deployment in South Korea, which is almost as dangerous as Afghanistan. But I talked to him the other day and he said, I asked him, I said, what's the chances of you ending up in Iraq right now. And he said, Dad, they call my unit up at any time. Which sent a shiver through my whole body. I will tell you this. I'm proud of my son's service. I'm proud of my family's service. I didn't go. I decided that was not for me. But I do not want my son killed because of a lie. And the reason why we are in Iraq and Afghanistan today is because of a lie told after 9-11. Mike, thank you for your service. All the us, the veterans in the air in, in the house today, thank you for your service. You see things that no human being should see when parts of bodies are torn away, when people die a violent death, men, women, and children. So I'm for peace, not for war. And any military person, active or veteran, basically will tell you the same thing. We don't want to go to war. But if we have to, we will. So we need to make it on our end that we'd have no more wars. No more wars. And I'll say this last thing and wrap it up. The Congressman Peter DeFazio has always voted for peace and against war. He's been a stalwart in that over the last 30 years that he has spent in Congress. And there is no elected official that I would trust more with the safety of my son than Peter DeFazio. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, for your service to our community. And I think on behalf of all of us, uh, please pass on our thanks to your son as well. Um, 
I want to take just a moment for a sort of a commercial break, if I might, uh, um, and because it's all about uh, action, right? That's why we're here, and uh, we are so thankful for all the work that Michael does, and I don't know if all you know that he has retired uh, from the Community Alliance of Lane County. It doesn't look like it, I know. Um, <laughs> But we're so appreciative of all the service he has given in this community for so many years. So, Michael, uh, tell us what we can do, will you? Okay. Uh, th thank you, Dan, for, that, uh, for those nice words. We are here today in solidarity with the people of Iran and Iraq, along with people all over the world, saying no to war with Iran. But, you know, that, that's not enough. We need to be taking action. We need to be challenging on an ongoing basis the U.S. war machine and declaring that war and assassination should never be instruments of U.S. foreign policy. Fortunately, our congressional delegation is with us, but not the White House. Now, I haven't done this in a while, but I urge you to join me. Call the White House comment line, 202-456-1111. And tell Trump what you think, no to war. Because he, our delegation is so good on, on the issue, I thought, we got it. Who, who needs to hear from us? Trump, call him. I'm, I'm going to do it as well. What's that number? 202-456-1111. I haven't done it in a while. It really is fun. It's very satisfying uh, just to be able to tell him what you think. So. At the same time, our congressional delegation, I mentioned that, but you know, you cannot thank people too much. So if they're doing the right thing, call or write and say, thank you for doing that. Uh, I know that with June here, I always try to you know, stay, in, stay in contact with June, uh, who does such great work for us. So it's important to keep those connections, keep that contact, taking action in, in, in this way. As, as was said, we need to be continually calling on Congress to take concerted action to cut the bloated Pentagon budget and bring those war dollars home to Oregon to fund the social and environmental program. Our partner Sue cannot be here tonight, uh, this afternoon because she's organizing a fundraiser for folks doing asylum work on, on the border. Uh, that's tonight. I'll give you more information about that later. But what she is, she is a war tax resistor. She does not pay the part of her taxes that go to war. That's like over 50%. And it takes real courage to do that. And we we'll just totally respect that. Others can do it as well. So if you're interested in that, talk to me, talk to Sue. It's just, oh, it's just amazing uh, what she does, and others as well. And the group I mentioned before, Taxes for Peace, Not War, the little group we have lo locally is a group doing that. Instead of fighting war, we need to be fighting climate change and taking action now. What many folks don't know is that the Pentagon is the largest institutional contributor to climate change in the world. So that's why when I talk about you know, peace and uh, you know, anti-militarism, we're saying yes to the yes to climate, yes. To to this planet. So the issues are really strongly uh, connected. So unless we can cut that pe Pentagon budget, it, we are in serious, serious trouble. So we have an action table back there. So do we, all the different groups here have some information back there. Sign our list. It's for the, the Planet versus uh, pe Pentagon group, which is a new group which has come together to let folks know about what's real about what's happening uh, with the Pentagon and climate change. So uh, clipboards are going to be passed around, so sign that if, if you can. And many of you know that when it comes that I'm usually the one appointed to raise the money. So this is yet another Michael Kerrigan money pitch. So it costs around $300 to cost to put on this event. So we're going to be, in addition to the clipboards, we're going to be passing around some, some buckets, so contribute if you can. And if you want to write a check, you can uh, write a check to 350 Eugene. So if we get any extra money here today, we're going to be donating that to uh, 350 to fund their continuing wonderful work in, in, in our community. Let's see. I think that is it. I just want to thank all of you for coming out here today. And let's think about things we can do, action we can take. 
It's great to be here, solidarity with, with all of you, but let's go out there and get the job done. Save the planet. Let's cut that military budget. Let's stop climate change and let's uh, then do it together. So thanks for coming out. Just a slight change in our schedule. Um, Johannes Tadeo, how do I say that? Where are you, Johannes? There he is. Oh, start coming on down. Um, is with us today. He is the community organizer for the Springfield Alliance for Equity and Respect, one of the programs of Community Alliance of Lane County. Uh, he served in that position for three years, and uh, particularly is appreciative to hear from a, a younger voice. Um, so come on up. Thank you. I'm reading on my phone, so I might have some technical difficulties. <laughs> so first, um, before I say who I am again, <laughs> I want to be able to acknowledge that we are on Kalapuya land and to acknowledge the Kalapuya people, as well as to honor all the veterans and all the veterans who have served and the veterans who have come back, as well as the ones that haven't. Um, so again, my name is Johanny Sadel. I am the Springfield Alliance for Equity and Respect Organizer, as well as a candidate for Springfield City Council Ward 3. We are living in a time that has lived before and lived through again in our nation's history. Many wars for unnecessary reasons, causing our fellow neighbors and community members to be hit, fighting for a war that we had no business being in. People of color and immigrants uh, join and fight for a country, causing families to be separated on false promises, to fight for a country that does not acknowledge us, nor hold a space for people of color to be represented. We could leave many of our community robbed and harmed for, what, for a war that should not have started by a drone that should have never been attacked. We have spent many hundreds of years in an oppressive structure that puts people against one another in an incredibly complicated way. It affects our, our impact on how efficiently we support our students. When we think about these teens who are around our city asserting their full humanity and who are envisioning a future in which they're learning and working and where their creative pursuits are, pursuits are truly valued. When we talk about war and how young folks and folks of color sacrifice our future within our home city and be sent off to a war erasing what later could thrive in our community, we are investing and spending millions of dollars on expenses of war when we could be using that money for our community to continue to thrive on health care, affordable housing, and, and support our vets who have already come home. In order to start this change, we need to continue to talk openly about the ongoing failures of our institutions. And organizations, we need to hold on to the screams of the past that continue to cascade around us and to learn from them. We have a track record of ex extinguishing people, people's existence, including culture, traditions, and inter internal systems. To elaborate for a brief moment, we are currently a country that are facing militarism in our backyard, with police targeting families, making them feel unsafe, unprotected, feeling hunted, and intimidated. A perfect example compared to what will and can happen on soil that's not ours. If we fail to stop this war, this would cause more deadly conflict and unleash untold civilian suffering, which would make blood be on our hands. Unless we as a country and us as citizens and community members and political leaders, who <laughs> and political leaders have the strength to stop this, for a country that does not want to take refugees, our government is okay with creating more. <laughs> Having people without homes and a country who determines who goes to war while all children, people of color, and underrepresented communities will be directly be affected fighting for a cause that started with greed, resources, and whatever reason we need to justify our historical patterns. We as a community should stand united against this, this divisive perspective. There's a systematic problem of how we cheat our veterans out of a future because they do not 
they do not get the proper support to go back to their communities and flourish. I have said this various times at different rallies, speaking engagements, and I will continue to say this, that the Iranian people are not our enemies, that they are our brothers and sisters in the struggle, and it is the imperialist capitalist system that is our enemy. Our tax dollars, what we work for, should not be spent on people abroad, on killing people abroad. We should stand against senseless wars, racism, poverty, and militarism, as challenges currently facing contemporary United States society. We have, we have come together, generations and elder generations. We must speak, we must grow, we must stand together and, be, and stand stronger together. People of color, students of color, forming alliances to stand against these divisive tactics. We must work with the new, with legislators, with positions of power, with military veterans. Let's come together, take a breath, and be able to say that no more war. And we're right. We need to start caring about our climate. And that's why I will endorse Doyle Cannon. And I hope that you all start caring and start speaking to your legislators, whichever one you choose. Because the, the whole point is for them to be able to hear us and hear our struggles and what we face and deal with every day. And to prevent these things from happening in other places overseas. So on that note, thank you and no more war. Thank you, Johannes. I look forward to seeing you on the Springfield City Council. That should be great. Yeah, thank you. Now, let me just say, my hat's off to anyone who runs for public office, including our next candidate, because that takes so much effort um, and uh, to put yourself out there like that. And so we give thanks uh, for all those who are doing that. So um, that leads us now to uh, Doyle Canning. Doyle is a mother and community organizer for many years in our community working on climate change, racial justice, worker and immigrant right issues, housing solutions, and much more. She is a graduate of the University of Oregon Law School and co-author of Reimagining Change, a book on using stories to change the world. So seeking to do her part for progressive change, she is now running, as I said previously, for the U.S. Congress. So I look forward to hearing more about her story today as well as in the days ahead. Doyle. Are they both on? Do adjust it for my stature. <laughs> my name is Doyle Canning, and I am here to ask you, are you ready to end this war? Are you ready to end this war? That's more like it. Are you ready not just to stop this war in Iran, but to end the forever wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Are you ready? Are you ready to end the war, Saudi-backed intervention in Yemen? Are you ready to end the war in Syria? Are you ready to end the practice of US-backed regime change operations all around the globe? I stand before you as a mother of a son, and I ask you, are you ready to end the draft? Are you ready to do what it takes, not just to abolish the selective service draft, but to abolish the poverty draft? to abolish the practice of recruiting working class kids, black, indigenous, people of color, poor kids without a lot of options to serve for the profits of oil companies and defense contractors. Are you ready to do what it takes to end the poverty draft, which means ending poverty? Yeah. 
Well, this is Eugene, so I know that you're ready, and I'm ready too. My name is Doyle Canning, and for almost 20 years, I have been working in the anti-war movement side by side with veterans of the occupations of Iraq, of Afghanistan, those who wage the drone wars in the desert of Nevada. I have spent years sitting with my peers, veterans who have shared their stories, and I have worked to bring those stories to the American people, working with organizations like About Face Veterans Against the War, bringing forward the ground truth of what U.S. foreign policy looks like at events like Winter Soldier, Iraq, and Afghanistan. I have held their hands. I have been a shoulder to cry on, and more than once I have picked up the phone because one of my comrades in the anti-war movement took their own life after their service to our government. There have now been more suicides by veterans of the forever wars than casualties on the battlefield. And that is part of why I am running for Congress. Today we're here to stop a war with Iran. And we are also here to end the forever wars that have defined and decimated my generation. We are here to go beyond that, to build the most powerful movement for peace that the world has ever seen, to transform U.S. foreign policy away from the priority of protecting fossil fuels and corporate profits towards protecting our climate and human rights. We have a vision and we have a plan of how to do it. And it begins by rejecting all contributions from defense contractors and war profiteers. Today, I am proud to release our platform to end the forever wars. It was developed over several months with the input of our Veterans for Canning Committee and many members of Eugene's prominent and legendary anti-war community. And so here to introduce that is my friend, Stephen Kiernan, a member of Common Defense. Thank you. Uh, even though I, you know, I teach over at the UO, so you think I would be used to this whole public speaking thing, but uh, still get a little nervous, so bear with me here. So, I was uh, I was 20 years old when I lost my legs. Uh, fighting in Fallujah, Iraq. Um, I joined the Marines when I was 17 uh, because I believed that I would be, I could make a difference, that I could help keep our country safe and help make the world a better place. But after witnessing and participating in you know what we did over in Iraq, and after spending two years at Walter Reed Army Hospital uh, recovering from my injuries, and seeing an endless stream of 18, 19, and 20 year olds like me coming home blown apart. And after, and after watching the family of a fellow Marine from my unit as they took their son off life support, I started asking myself, was this all worth it? What was it that we accomplished? And after thinking a long time, you know, what we accomplished in Iraq and Afghanistan, 
was killing hundreds of thousands of people, of forcing millions more to become refugees. What we accomplished was the destabilization of an entire region so that corporate corporations could make billions. What we fought for was nothing more than to secure oil access for companies like Exxon. And the longer the occupation went on, the longer they continue to go on, the more money will be made from companies like KBR, Halliburton, Raytheon, General Dynamics. And I realized that the only way we can end these wars is to end the corporate influence that fuels them. That's why I'm here today. That's why I'm a member of Common Defense, a movement of progressive veterans working to end forever, war, uh, forever wars and also push for progressive policies like Medicare for All and the Green New Deal. That's why I'm part of Veterans for Canning and why I helped play a role in developing our platform for foreign policy. A few of the things that I'm most particularly proud of is our stance on ending political contributions by defense contractors because no politician can claim to be anti-war while they're taking money off of war profiteers. And once we remove their influence through political contributions and lobbying, we can recenter our foreign policy around people and planet and not power and profit. And lastly, I'll, I'll mention that we need to ban military recruitment in middle and high schools. Yes. So that working class kids like I was aren't preyed upon by these military recruiters to go and fight on behalf of corporate billionaires. So anyway, that's the platform I helped create, and that is why I'm here today. Uh, thank you, Doyle, for inviting me, uh, and thank you for coming here and hosting this event. Uh, I will now hand this mic back. Thank you. So we're here today because we're ready to lead with a new vision. This platform is not a, just about stopping Trump's latest escalation of war with Iran, but about ending the forever wars, exposing US-backed interference abroad, and taking a stand against the military-industrial complex. is also a movement to end the failed war on drugs that has locked up millions of black and brown and poor people and made our nation the world's leader in incarceration. Our movement for peace is a movement to welcome newcomers, immigrants, asylum seekers, because when the United States supports regime change, in Honduras, and then turns away Honduran refugees who walked a thousand miles just with the clothes on their back and the babies in their arms. That is war. Our movement for peace is 
a movement to transition our country and our global economy to renewable energy. A global movement to stabilize our climate, to fundamentally reorient United States foreign policy from its focus on protecting strategic reserves of fossil fuels to protecting our planet. From defending defense industry profits to defending human rights. <laughs> Dr. King explained to us that peace is not the absence of conflict. It is the presence of justice. And so we must continue our work for justice. And we cannot call to abolish the draft without recognizing that we already have a draft that targets predominantly poor youth, black, indigenous, people of color, Native Americans serve at higher rates per capita than any group. Why is that? Because the forever war has been going on for centuries. Working class kids join because there's a promise of three meals a day, of health care, of college. These are promises we can make to everyone if we are willing to do what it takes to transform that budget to cut the $700 billion bonanza giveaway of our tax dollars to defense contractors and provide tuition-free public college to every young person in this country. <laughs> to guarantee health care as a human right. And to work for human rights around the world by leading the fight against climate change and taking care of climate refugees. Let us commit today to building that movement for peace, for justice. Let us march on in the proud tradition here in Eugene, unbought by defense contractors, unbossed by oil companies, and unafraid to speak the truth and to fight for the bold changes we need. That's why I'm running for Congress. Thank you for your support. Thank, thank, thank you both. So just uh, two more important voices to hear from. Uh, Lex Warden is a representative for the Eugene Hub of the Sunrise Movement, a national youth-led climate activist group fighting the climate crisis and demanding political support for the Green New Deal. So, Lex. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Um, thank you to the veterans who are in the house. Thank you to those who have spoken before me. And thank you to everyone who had a hand in organizing this protest. It is my humbled honor to be here with all of you today. I'd like to start with another land acknowledgement. I don't think one or two or three is even enough, but we'll, we'll go from there. The Willamette Valley was is and will always be the ancestral home of the Kalapuya Ilihi tribe. To acknowledge this is to recognize the war on indigenous peoples which lays way for settler colonialism in this country. To acknowledge this is to recognize the resiliency of native communities throughout the Americas and the expertise of traditional ecological knowledge in combating the climate crisis. Lately, I've been struggling to find the words that I feel must be said. I often feel like I am not the best person to speak with all of you because of my lack of experience with war and because of my white privilege. I am not Iranian, nor am I a target for violence because of my skin color or because I was born in another country. There are many individuals who deserve the mic if they should want it. 
because people have tried to silence them. I have much to learn about what it means to be an accomplice in the fight for social and environmental justice. I acknowledge these truths so that I can speak with you from my soul song. It is your choice whether or not you listen. I want to speak about hope today and its sibling, fear. There's the fear on all sides of looming war with Iran. There's the fear of losing home and habitat due to the greed of our species. There's the fear within us all that we are small and don't amount to much. Fear allows us to pretend superiority over other humans and the more than human world. It shuts us off and pushes others out. Fear becomes the narrative that justifies apathy in the face of injustice. The climate crisis and the capitalistic system we exist within are testimonies to the destruction and trauma that fear promises us as our leader. I believe it to be my moral responsibility to challenge fear-driven narratives. It is a responsibility I do not take lightly. It is a responsibility I have dedicated my life to. I believe with every fiber of my being in the empathy and love that exists in this magical world. Empathy has given me hope. Hope has opened my eyes to new ways of existing. Hope has shown me that to demand justice is to begin on a path towards an empathetic world. A world where our species respects and cherishes the differences that make us so beautiful. A world where we understand that life is a web and what we do now affects all of life around us. A world that is committed to love and empathy. The world I believe in will not come about without action, without compassion, without discomfort. Fear will demand that we stay satisfied with the status quo. Hope asks that we commit ourselves to a new way of thinking, of acting, of dreaming. Hope understands that it will be difficult and that the, lo and that the road is long. Hope asks us to take a step forward regardless. Hope asks us to challenge our personal and collective narratives, to take accountability, and to self-reflect. Hope asks us to take action rooted in love and empathy. I plead with you to not give up. I ask that you support those who are at their wit's end. And I thank you for the work you are doing and will do in the future. I refuse to let anyone tell me that peace on earth is not possible. <laughs> Empathy has shown me that peace on earth is indeed possible. I hope you will all join me on the road to compassionate action. I wish to walk alongside each and every one of you on the road to justice. When we walk together, we will remind each other that we are more than our fears. When we walk together, we will remind each other of the magical world within and around us. When we walk together, we will remind each other of our love. May we all walk together in peace and in solidarity. Thank you. Thank you, Lex. Incredibly powerful stuff we are hearing today. 
Finally, you have heard about the uh, uh, Planet versus Pentagon, right? Uh, new uh, campaign. Uh, Susan McConson is has worked on a number of campaigns for social change, including Kids for a Clean Taiwan, the No on Nine campaign, uh, pro-choice uh, for women uh, issues, environmental issues, uh, uh, working with the Sierra Club. Uh, she recently helped to win a lawsuit against the Army Corps of Engineers to protect the Puget Sound Islands. <laughs> and she is working with 350.org and now our Planet versus Pentagon campaign. So, Susan, come on up, share with us what we can do. Well, hi. <laughs> um, so, I, I just want to take a little break and I want to sing a little song for somebody in this room. And I want you guys, I'm a terrible singer, so I really want you guys to help me sing. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Doyle, happy birthday to you. <laughs> so we started Planet vs. Pentagon because we were really concerned that the environmental groups in the country were not talking about the Pentagon and about war and about these corporations that are driving war. Um, and if you look at this beautiful banner made by Susan Kundruff, you can see that most of our budget is going to war. Um, well over 60%, but once you add in vets and you add in international affairs and you add in all the other things that are connected to the military in some fashion or another, it's well over 60%. We, get, we now get a measly 2% for science. How do you think we're going to educate people about the climate catastrophe when we get no money? We have a congressman who is on the Transportation, transportation Committee. He gets they get 7% of the budget. Do you think we're going to get high-speed trains like China? Do you think we're going to get high-speed trains like Russia? We're so busy making enemies of China and Russia and Iran that we can't afford to have nice things in this country like health care, education. <laughs> but the bigger problem is we don't have money to help our climate. And we have a Congress who is very bipartisan when it comes to voting for these bills. And our congressmen in this state don't. And we're really lucky because we do have 450 contractors for the military in this state. Don't think our state isn't part of the problem. So we really want you to join us. Um, and our goal is to educate people in this country, all people in this country, because for us to change the dynamics of our government to get away from these corporate contractors who buy our congressmen, buy our president, and, and buy Washington, D.C., basically. And they send our kids to war, kids who think they're going to war to protect me. They're going to war to protect Exxon, which is polluting our environment. Here's just an example. U.S. military uses enough fuel in one year to pay for mass transit for the whole country for 22 years. The amount of money that's going into the military and all these contractors is phenomenal. And the amount of fuel going to the states 
that have these big bases on them is phenomenal. And one of the ironic things that I find is, I lived in Washington State for a while, and, and they, Inslee will be up there and he was touting how great they're doing on their carbon emissions in Washington State. Same with California, same with Texas. They're very proud of lowering their carbon emissions. You know why their carbon emissions are so low? Anybody know? They don't, thank you, they don't count the military. When I lived in Washington State, we had the big transport planes going over our home every day, multiple times a day. They like, they drop, the, when they're doing their bombing ranges in the summer, they light the place on fire. They always have to shut stuff down because they start fires. They now are, because we're, you know, we've decided that China's now our big enemy, they're now moving all of this military planes and equipment to the west coast. And on uh, Woodby Island, it's so bad there now that people in their homes are having, it's like having an earthquake multiple times a day. The dishes fall off the walls. They're, you know, everything's shaking from these military high-speed jets. And the quietest place in the United States was in the Olympic Peninsula. It's now been recorded by a ranger up in the, Olympic, in the Olympics that they had these high-speed jets flying over the National Park every 15 minutes. These things create sonic booms, but they also use so much fuel that it's, it's insane. So we need to talk about the military and the climate because we, we can't stop climate change unless we stop the biggest polluter in the world. So here's what we're going to ask. Uh, first, I, I, I would ask all of you in this room to take time to educate yourselves about who our enemies are. And that means getting off of the mainstream media. That means getting off of Fox. It means getting off of NPR. It means getting off of the Washington Post, the New York Times, MSNBC. Why? because these corporations are owned by the very people that want us to stay in war. Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post and he also got one of the biggest CIA contracts ever. You think he's gonna tell you the truth about why we're trying to start a war in Iran? The New York Times has never met a war it doesn't like. So get off the media that is pushing war. There's lots out there. And we have a Facebook page, and I'll make sure that we start putting some of that media up. Um, the second thing is we will be at PILC with a panel, and we would invite any of you guys to be there. What's PILC? PILC, the, environmental, the International Environmental Law Conference at the University of Oregon. Then we will be having a town hall, and I believe we have secured our speaker, who will be Ajima Baraka. Um, he ran as um, Jill Stein's running mate. He's an amazing guy, writes for Jack Black Agenda Project. If you want some really good information about war in this country, that's a great place to start. <laughs> and um, that'll be happening either the 15th, 16th, or 17th, we have it of, of April. It will be the kickoff for a week of environmental activism. Um, ask your, we, Doyle, you know, mentioned, you know, pushing to get divestment. We need you to push the city council, the county commission, and the state to divest from the war machine. And, and y you, can, you can boycott Amazon. <laughs> the other, a lot, a lot of the other, uh, you, 
know, a lot of the other war machine is really hard to boycott, but, but you can boycott Amazon. Um, and the biggest thing you can do is that one of our goals is to have panels that actually go out to all over the place. And we need people on those panels because five of us don't want to do it by ourselves. Um, so help us, join us. And also speak to people about what, what is happening in this country. We have a country that's being run by military contractors, pharmaceutical industries, banks, banks and, and we need to take it back. And, and don't ever fool yourself into thinking that this is a Republican agenda. This is a bipartisan agenda. Sign the clipboards, join us. We're so glad you came, and thank you.